Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. And we'll conclude this next week with the conclusion of the last passage in Jonah, which should take a whole week to do in and of itself. But Jonah chapter 4. And it says this, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? And Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and make, made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint and wanted to die. And said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. And we'll stop there. Published in the Vineyard Devotions, a devotional publishing company, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, it read almost in a prophetic way this devotion. Yes, we are angry. Many are angry with our president and leaders because we have deemed them the culprit of all of our problems. America is a nation deeply divided, regardless of whom it is that sets in the White House. We no longer address our differences with respect. We are driven by anger. Many are angry with our parents because they failed us in some way. Our impatience with our own kids is blamed on the fact that dad had little patience with us or so we justify. We are angry with ourselves for our lack of perfection. We are angry with our bosses because they are unappreciative of our abilities. They don't take the time to know who we really are. We are angry with our spouse because he or she has not lived up to our expectations or they have changed everything in some way. We're angry with the driver in front of us who doesn't know how to drive or the clerk at the grocery store who obviously is in training running the computer gadget. We are angry with God because he has let us down in some way or another. Our families are being destroyed from within with anger. We are informed by psychologists that our schools are on the teeter edge. Our children go to school each day with students ready to explode because of anger. Some neighborhoods resemble war zones because of anger. We have become a society more and more excluded from each other with eight-foot privacy fences to ensure that we don't have to deal with someone else. Our courts are filled with frivolous lawsuits due to a society that increasingly is unable to resolve its own conflicts and work through its differences. Our children are witnessing an increased amount of tension and conflict motivated by anger. The movies are filled with rage and anger. Years ago, there would be a 30-second display of emotion, but now it escalated into a 15-minute non-stop explosive scene which requires thousands of rounds of ammunition. An entire block has to be leveled. This must occur before equilibrium can be reached, all driven by anger and revenge. Marriage and family counselors are booked months in advance just assisting those who have learned the skills of conflict resolution, how to de-escalate a situation. More and more family members confess that they have for 20 years or more lived in what they describe as walking on eggshells or living in a home where they were wondering when the next eruption would occur. This stress and constant turmoil have pushed certain members over the top. Some resort to depression 
Others bury the seed of anger deep within. Anger is everywhere. Church leaders are now being trained how to deal with cantankerous and combative personalities in their congregation. There are personalities at church and in the workplace who are always looking for conflict, tension, and disturbance. If you solve all of their problems on Monday by Friday, they'd have a whole new list. Many try to find release from it through drugs and or alcohol, but at times these methods only serve to break down the, per the personal inhibitions, and then what happens is they release the real hidden anger, the anger within. So we have been co seeing commonplace in our society that in a drunken or drug-induced state, a person carries out hideous acts that later they say in court, I don't know what came over me. Some have explained that some form of evil possesses them, but seldom do we ever realize the power of deep-seated anger within. Anger. God deals with anger. Jonah chapter 4. Do you have a right to be angry? I remember a Guatemalan student who said to me, my country, and he's no longer here, he's back in Guatemala, my country sure has a lot of issues to deal with, and drug trafficking, drug lords, human trafficking, the whole thing going on there. But he said to me, it's interesting that even in the midst of all the conflict that is part of my culture back home, I, I, I see in America more anger than I even do back in Guatemala. And I don't, I don't uh, question that too much. It's there. A, a few weeks ago, we were down seeing Janet's sister down in, uh, in uh, Waukesha, we started taking Interstate 43. Now, we try to get out of there early enough that we don't hit that traffic coming home out, you know, out of Milwaukee. And uh, we were a little bit late. We were playing a game, and we didn't want to rush it, so we came out a little late. And that early rush right there toward around 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 3.30, whatever it is, we could see that the interstate was kind of bottlenecking a little bit, but the traffic was moving. Now, my, my thing that I do is I, I just set the speed control at 73. It's on tape. 73, it's three miles over the speed limit. I know that. But I set it at 73. And so I'm just going at 73. You always come on the back of a semi-truck, okay? And then you're trying to get around him. And if he's going 72 and a half, it takes you about five minutes before you get totally around him. And you can start seeing the cars bunching up behind you. Now, how many of you guys get angry at drivers like that? Okay. Some of you are lying. Some of you are telling the truth. But I could see in my rearview mirror that the driver behind me was starting that motion like, come on, come on, as we're just kind of like barely getting by that semi, just taking my time to get around. Because I wasn't going to speed up and get around. And I, I kind of said over to Jack, I said to her, I think, I think he's getting a little irritated behind me, but I'm not going to speed up just for him. He can wait just like everybody else. And so I got around the semi, and when I got around far enough, I pulled back in, and when he went around us, he made for certain I knew that he was real irritated. <laughs> Anger. It's everywhere, people. It, it's everywhere. It's on the interstate, it's on the highways. It's in our schools. University Alumni Buffet, Breakfast Buffet, years ago. You're in that line, and you're going through the line, and they've got pancakes here, and they have waffles here, and then you get the scrambled eggs, and then you get the sausage, and then you get the bacon. And I was going through, and I'm taking a little bit of this. Yes, I eat a little bit of fruit, and I eat a little bit of this, and I get to the bacon, and I take the tongs, and about six pieces come up. 
So I put three on my plate and I turned around to the gal behind or next to me. I said, I, I took too much. Would you like some bacon? Now she could have just simply said no. No, thank you. But instead, what is what do I get? I don't eat dead animals. <laughs> oh, okay. And then starts the dissertation on animal rights and all this stuff. And we are a society, people, that has a lot of tension. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I would suspect some of you know better that have lived there. But years ago, people just kind of like if they didn't want to eat meat, they just didn't eat meat. If they didn't want to do this, they just didn't do it. But today, it's like, it's compelling. You know, all you have to say is, I'm sorry, I, I don't care for any thank you. No, I don't eat dead animals. It's our culture today. I don't know where all this goes in this anger-filled culture where, where we have got the idea today that, that everything has to be right or wrong, good or evil, but think about it. We've come there. Janet and I were years ago going to start a new church up in Washburn, Wisconsin, and everything fell through and it didn't work out. And our kids were still in elementary school at the time. And so that led us to staying in Aiken, Minnesota. And so I, we, we lived a few years in Aiken, Minnesota, and, and I took a job then as a, a counselor at the mental health clinic there in Aiken. And so I had a tour of duty of that to kind of get out of the ministry for a while and just kind of have time to, to rethink things. But it was interesting because they didn't know me there as a pastor. I think many people who met us thought I was in mental health work my entire life, and I, and I wasn't. But as we moved into a house there in Aiken, the neighbors all came over and they were greeting us, and they had their kids there, and some of the kids were, would be our kids' age in school, so they got to meet some kids they would meet in school. It was good and fun and everything. So I decided to just do something out of just curiosity. I, I said, well, today's Saturday, and we're all moved in. Tomorrow's Sunday. Does anyone know a good church that we should attend? I just thought it would be interesting to see what they said. And I'll never forget the one lady. She looked up and she said, well, all I'm going to tell you is don't go to our church. We all hate the preacher and we're trying to get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't go to that church even though I was curious about it. We are, can I just say, we're on the teeter's edge as a culture. It just seems like it doesn't take much anymore before we just go over the top. Because there's a lot of anger. Jonah had a right to be angry. angry. Maybe we all feel we do too. Because in the brokenness of our society, in the brokenness of our culture, many of us are angry. We cover it well. I have things that happened to me that should have never happened in it. I cover it really well. And God asked Jonah a very good question. Do you have a right? Now Jonah is going to be really careful because you can see what, what he says there in that, in that statement that he gives. Look what he says. Jonah 4, verses 2 and 3. Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, oh, Lord, just take my life, or it's better for me to die than to live, because, yes, Lord, I have a right to be angry. But I know you. And I know what you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me no. You're going to disavow my 
in here. And I hate the Ninevites. They've done terrible things to us. And I want to see revenge. And I'm going to build me a place up above the city where I can look down on them. And your job, God, is to strike them out. To, to, to solve this issue because they deserve it. And God says, but I am a gracious God. I have the right to be slow to anger. There's another passage of scripture that we need to look at if we're going to really do this justice. And that scripture is found in Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 through 7. Genesis 4, 2 through 7. Remember the story here? When, now, when Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Remember this? But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor, so Cain was very angry. And his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, about the same question he asked of Jonah. The Lord asked him, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin, oh, this is great. Sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is to have you, to own you. But you must master it. People, I'm going to tell you this morning, the power of anger, if you've ever dealt with it. It is the cancer of the soul. It will eat you up alive. It will distort reality for you in all situations. It will cause you to do things that you never thought you could do. It's an impulsive reaction. Its power over you is amazing. And God knew it. He knew it for Jonah. He said, Jonah, you've got to get a grip on this. He said to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. I know the thoughts in your heart already. You got to master it. Now, when he said that, you got to master it, did he say, you, you got to ignore it? No. You got to deny it. That's what we'll do. We'll deny it and I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I'm not angry. No, no, no. He didn't say that. You must master it, me. You accept it. You come to terms with that. You deal with that. And you find victory over it. And you might be saying to me today, how can you do that? In a world that has deceit, in a world that I have no doubt that you might possibly have bosses that have treated you totally unfair. Family members who have totally taken advantage of you. A spouse that completely cheated. And there are people that have just that burning anger within. I remember it, it's almost, it's almost funny to me. But it's not. But in a ladies' Bible study, one of the ladies decided one time. To confront a lady regarding the fact that after a year of these Bible studies, weekly, she was still dealing with her husband's infidelity like as if it would just happen that week, and yet it was a situation that had been years back. And so she just said in a calm way, Brenda, We've been doing these studies for over a year, and you are still just totally absorbed in Tom's infidelity. There's a time when God let things go and move on. I think you're really angry. I'm not angry! <laughs> Why do you think I'm angry? I don't know. Let me see. Give me three, three choices here. Yes. 
You must master it means that I have to come to terms with it. I have to say, Lord, I, I am angry inside. Lord, I feel cheated. Lord, I feel abused. Lord, I feel... But your will be done. And God now is looking at Jonah, our servant, and he's saying, Jonah, you, you can build that place up on the mountainside there and look down on Nineveh and wait for me to strike them. Or you can move on with your life in the knowledge that I'm sovereign God to you and I'm sovereign God to them too and my sovereign will will be carried out in its due time to them in a fair and just way and to you in a fair and just way. But you're actually asserting yourself over me by saying I have the right to be angry. Think about that now. <clears throat> when we allow that anger and emotion bitterness in our life to take over, then we're actually saying, I'm taking charge of things and not allowing God to do that. Ephesians chapter 4. This is what it means. Paul writes, chapter 4, verse 28, be ye angry. Be ye angry, he says. And then what's the next three words? Anyone remember? And sin not. Isn't it amazing? I mean, the Bible is a great psychologist. It's saying, I understand you can't control the, the emotion of your anger of that, that it's there, it's there. But be ye angry and sin not. And then it says. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now that doesn't just mean literally I have only 12 hours or so to be angry and when the sun goes down I have to get it up. No, it just means don't let that anger burn in you indefinitely. Come to terms with how do I come to terms with How do we act as a church in the midst of an angry world? Here's the key. Jonah gives it to us in Jonah chapter 4 again. Gracious. Now, I wanted to say to the gal who said, I don't eat dead flesh or dead animals. Oh, you prefer them alive then. Oh, that's being mouthy. That's not solving. That's not being gracious. Okay? Be ye gracious. Okay, what's the next thing he said there? Compassionate. Have you ever thought the power of dealing with people who are overcome with anger which is trying to be a compassionate listener? Slow to anger. Guard your heart. And then it's all overarching, abounding in love. What if we as a church, as we start this new adventure in our life of a church, determined to be a gracious church, a compassionate church, and for all I know, you already have been. But we want to just keep that up, that vision and mission. Slow to anger and abounding in love. I want to tell you what's going to happen. Someone, maybe a 15-year-old gal who's going to find herself pregnant and not wanting to be, will say things like, I was going through a really hard time. My parents and I were struggling, but I knew that I could find love at Hickory Church. Because there they will love you and care for you, irregardless. And the person who loses their job and going through a hard time says, but I knew I could come to the people of Hickory Church because they will love me and help me, irregardless. What if that became 
the theme. And through time, we, we develop that image to such a way that a community around us understood us to be that. Not like Jonah looking down and waiting for God's judgment. Oh, what did they do this time? But instead, come. We will envelop you. We will love you. We will care for you. We want to be the place that gives you that acceptance in a world that doesn't accept you. We want to be slow to anger. And we want to be abounding in love. And God is saying to our servant Jonah, that's what I want for you. And Jonah is struggling. We're we'll going see next week where he goes with this. Because Jonah is saying, God, I want to be angry. I've been there. I don't want to let it go. Sometimes being angry and being smart is fun. And God says, Jonah, it gets you no place. It's the cancer of your soul. It only breeds in your own life unhappiness, pain, and sorrow. Let it go. And enjoy it. The life that I have for you. In a world free from anger. Our response to the world, I'm convinced, in this world that doesn't even listen to you, you can't even dialogue anymore, is to just back away in a compassionate way, respond to those hearts. They don't know what to do with it. Because there's nobody doing that. Let's pray. Lord God, if there is anger and bitterness, it might run up from events that happened in our life when we were children. Situations that we have still struggled to let go of. And it just burns within us and and sometimes it's not there, and sometimes we forget it, and then we assume something, it just comes back again. It leads us into a world of depression, anxiety, and sorrow, and whatever. Lord, let's find freedom from that, that you can set us free from the pain of that journey. That we can experience your love and your compassion, your mercy, your grace, and what you call life more abundant. Help us to find through Christ who gives us faith. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to.